Hi, um, I'm Amy. Uh, as we said, I'm uh, kind of an artist and designer, That's my background. Um, I kind of started, just to give you kind of an overview of um, my career, I suppose, is, um, is it on? Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello? Is that better? Um, okay, so I kind of started my career in kind of video game design just as a, as a researcher and then I've, since then I've been um, studying and working as a graphic designer um, within exhibition design specifically um, and more recently I've been doing an MA in um, my course is called information experience design so um, that's kind of a general overview of my background. Um, do you want to? Yeah thanks, uh, so yeah my, my name is Will Hartley uh, I'm a research astronomer at University College London. Uh, I did my PhD some years ago now in, in Nottingham. And, and really, the, the use of AI has been prevalent in astronomy for a long, long time. But with the, the kind of increasing computing power, the, the use of machine learning and advanced machine learning techniques it is really, really growing. Uh, and so that's an area that I'm, uh, I'm branching into. Okay, so we're just both going to talk a bit about citizen science today and just um, kind of looking at it from different perspectives. So from Will as a scientist and, and from me as like a designer. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully it's interesting. So it's just a very kind of informal discussion, really. Um, so, yeah, so these are the kind of things we're going to talk about. So um, collective intelligence. Um, sorry. Can you, hear, can you all hear me? Okay, uh, yeah, so data collection, data classification, um, we'll just go through some examples and then talk about how potentially the kind of the blurring of kind of traditional discipline boundaries. Um, so, yeah, so, <laughs> so sorry. sorry, okay, so. Um, so collective intelligence, um, so it's kind of this idea of, of the kind of the global brain, so the, the, the individual, the collective over the individual, so um, the, the, the mass of data when you kind of put, um, you know, a, lot, a, lot, a crowd together, you, you kind of having this um, collective, uh, how am I going to explain this, <laughs> you, you kind of, you stop. <laughs> okay, yeah, so one person forging ahead can do wonderful things, of course. Um, but different people have different ways of viewing a problem or, or, or even a concept. And so by using like the, uh, the advantage of, of all these different angles of, of looking at something, uh, you can achieve so much more. Um, this is part of the reason why scientific, scientific collaborations are, are international and often very large. Um, but also, of course, it happens in design world and art as well. Uh, because those are the sort of things you yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this idea of um, uh, it's interdisciplinary kind of uh, concept. So, um, sorry. I, I do apologise. I'm just going to change. Uh, okay. So yeah. So let's move on. So um, what what we're interested kind of here is um, so what what can machines offer that humans can't, and vice versa. So um, with 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 humans. Um, this idea of creativity and emotion is maybe something that we're kind of better at. So, you know, social interaction, um, something very subtle things that's quite difficult to teach um, an AI to kind of um, interact and, um, you know, you know the kind of the Turing test, like how, how do you trick a human into thinking that they're speaking to another human? It's very difficult. So, um, so it's potentially things that, that, that humans are better at. Um, and then you've got this kind of idea of efficiency, so you kind of know that, that machines are a lot more efficient at, you know, maths problems, for example. And a lot more, um, you know, they don't get tired, for example, and they, they're very controllable. Um, and you don't need to worry so much about morals when you're controlling a machine, essentially, at the moment. So that's kind of uh, an interesting 
Well, so and, and then and then also this idea of kind of who who is traditionally allowed to collect data. So um, you know, so so we kind of think traditionally a scientist collects data, but maybe maybe we could say that kind of all kind of all contributions um, and all data is maybe useful um, if we kind of ask the correct questions of it. So thinking that like everyone can can um, provide something, an insight that maybe you, you wouldn't necessarily kind of think of the traditional uh, uh, traditional scientific methods, kind of moving further from that. Um, and then also like the value of data, so what makes data valuable um, <laughs> and um, what, what is kind of truth and fact and, and is all data and information kind of subjective um, coming from a different context, for example. So yeah, from my point of view, I just wanted to talk about kind of the design of uh, cultural probes and, and apps and interfaces and instructions, so when you're talking about citizen science. So, um, and how, how these kind of things actually have a direct influence on the kind of data that you're collecting, um, so the types of data, um, and, and, and also I wanted to talk about the experience of using these things. Uh, so, this idea of gamification, I don't know if that's a term that everyone's heard of, um, but it's basically like using gaming principles to make something fun and, and interactive and, and, and make you want to come back to it and, and use it. Um, so these are just some examples. So we've got um, on this side, iRecord. Uh, uh, iRecord is like a, um, a company that does a few of these um, specifically uh, uh, animal conservation. So this is kind of my area of interest. So my, most of my thing, most of my examples are coming uh, around animal conservation. So this is iRecord butterflies, and it's basically um, it's an app, um, and it's asking you to give certain um, certain uh, data, so photo photographs, upload photographs, um, tell them which species you're, um, it, you, you think it is, and, and all of this stuff. So, so it's just how, how you interact with that as an app um, versus, for example, um, Alicia Fernandez's work here, uh, Tech Cultural Probes, which are basically these um, little um, instruments that um, you can use to, to provide data. So, um, so for example, this this is all around happiness. So, t so telling um, the the uh, telling the um, the people that are collecting the data kind of how happy you are. So, it's quite interesting the interface how how that affects um, how that affects the data. For for example, the one in the middle is like a sliding scale from zero to one hundred. So that's kind of it's giving giving a number to your happiness levels, which is kind of like an interesting. I mean. That's an interesting format for it, and, it, and um, yeah, obviously that affects that affects the data. So then, and then the last one is this um, the Wild Wildlife Watch, uh, which is a Zooniverse project, which we'll we'll talk a bit about later. There's a few of them that we're looking at, um, and this is just like an in instructions of how, how how you how you supply the data. So the instructions, the point here is that the instructions are really useful, and um, they they have a massive effect on how how people. Supply, supply the data. So, so um, I guess uh, what kind of what I want to say is that you know if you're if you are um, uh, going to explore one of these projects, maybe it's, it's interesting to look at where at what point the public become involved in it. So, for example, do the public come involved at the collection point, um, at the point where the data is collected? Do they come in at the point where um, the data is classified, um, or do they come in at the point where you're double checking the decisions made by a computer, for example? Um, and also, how does this define the data? So let's just discuss some examples. Um, this is uh, an app called um, Penguin Watch by Zooniverse. Um, so you've got this kind of landing page where you're given this little ex explanation of, of what, what you're being asked to do and why. So it just literally is just very simply telling you, I'm going to tag penguins in remote, uh, remote regions to help us understand their lives and environment. So um, you can learn more or get started, and it's just a call to action straight away to get started on this. Um, and then you're taken immediately to this page where, um, where you've got this, this picture that's kind of 
coming over the whole screens. It's very visual. Um, and then you've got the ways that you can begin to give the data. So you're given a very simple task instruction at the top here. Um, you know, you classify adults with this tag, you classify chicks with this tag, eggs with this tag, and other with this tag. Um, so you kind of immediately almost know what to do because it's this idea of gamification. It's kind of like you just click the penguins and this, it's kind of a fun, fun task. And even like the design of the markers that mark them, I don't know if you can see, it's quite dark, but you can see that they kind of almost look like targets. It's a bit, a bit weird, <laughs> kind of like a bit of a shooter game or something. But like it, it, it kind of immediately, you, you kind of count the penguins. It's kind of fun. Um, they very simply asked, um, have you marked the animals? Yes, or there were too many to count. So it's very easy to use. Simply uh, yes, and then um, and then you've also given given an option to, uh, to to talk under the blue the blue one. So that you can come back to that, but that's kind of a community element as well, which is kind of interesting. So you say, for example, yes, I've counted them all, and immediately after that, you're taken to the next the next um, example. So uh, the next photograph. So you immediately it's kind of you you're not. It, you, you, you don't have a chance to kind of back out of it, you're just straight into the next task. And this way, they can keep you kind of involved and engaged in this. Um, and and that's, that's quite an interesting uh, way of um, yeah, keeping the public involved. Because, because uh, you know, when, when there's no financial gain, for example, for the public to be involved in these projects, it's just, you know, so these apps have to be really, like, it's called sticky. To, in order to keep people engaged in them. Um, so, so yes, yeah, just so qu some quick observations on, on the data. So, so the, kind of the, the photographic data of the penguins has already been collected for you. So the public didn't collect that data. But the public, in this case, helps with the classification of that data. So it tell, they, um, the public tells um, the, the, the project's owners uh, that um, Zooniverse in this case, that tells them, um, you know, for example, there are four penguins in this picture. So that's a picture with four penguins, and therefore it is, it's classified in that way. Um, uh, limited options um, keeps the data really specific. So you can't tell them, for example, oh, I saw a penguin, it was rolling over, and uh, it's, it's not this kind of data. It's literally there was a one, one penguin. So this kind of thing means that the data, yeah, is kept very specific. Um, and then observations on user experience. Uh, so, so it's a it's a computer-based activity um, through the browser. So you have to go online. Um, so this is kind of maybe interesting as well to say, you know, who who can be involved in this? Well, you have to have internet access and you have to have a computer. So it's kind of that's the, the types of people that are that are able to do this. So that does exclude some people. Just as a side note, that's kind of a whole other discussion. But um, yeah, the stickiness of the process, like I said, there's, um, it's kind of gamified, you, you, it, it's fun, um, and, and there's community elements. So for example, when you press the talk button, you can, you can start to comment on these photographs. So you, if you have an issue with the, the classification of the photograph, you can, ask, you can ask other people if they have the same issue, or, or you can start to talk about it. And, and that community element is also quite a classic way to bring people back to, to something, because it's, you know, it's building social kind of uh, relationships and that, that kind of keeps people involved. Um, yeah, and it's just really easy to use, fluid transition to next image, and the ability to skip thing, images of you if you're like bored of it, um, that, that's really useful as well. The last example I'm going to talk about, before we pass you on to Will, is this, um, is this again, I record, so it's a different one, so this is I record ladybirds specifically. It's a di quite a different experience, so I just wanted to to kind of compare this. So with this one, your landing page is, is slightly different, but you still can still a bit similar. You can press new sighting, similar to um, just with the with the penguin one. But this one doesn't really give you any explanation of, of what you're doing or why you'd want to do this. Um, it then kind of goes into this. Um, this big page of, you know, add a photo, identify the species, add a location, add a number of species, add a ha habitat, uh, or add a note. Um, and like, so it's asking you to do quite a lot um, and not really giving you a reason to, to do these things. Um, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, I, I, I use this sometimes because, um, yeah, I've got a really 
love I love ladybirds and insects, but um, I find it like even though I love I'd love to be involved in it, I always I find it quite difficult to use, and so I wanted to talk about you know why that might be. So yeah, it's um, adding a photo obviously always a bit annoying on your phone. You have to try and you know like it have to, it asks for access to your photo album and all of that stuff. Adding a location, it's like it could turn a bit into like you know, dirty data in that if you can't quite work out how to make it show your correct location, the data is a bit wrong and therefore it's not that useful. Um, and uh, so yeah, so, and then Habitat, if it's not in the drop down list, there's like a drop down list, but you know, it's, it's kind of, there's a lot of potential for kind of dirty data in this and I think that's quite interesting. And then at the end you, you get to this page, thank you, you know, it's this, um, your sighting has been added to the database and that's kind of that's kind of it. So unlike the penguin one, it doesn't draw you straight back in. It just it gives you like a thank you and a tick. And so therefore, you have a point at which you can kind of quit the app, and so you're not necessarily wanting to engage again. Um, but maybe it's interesting to say that if you're if you're signed in like I am here, you can see I, I'm a recorder at the bottom, Amy Haig. And so and then at that point, it says you can view and edit your records. So that's quite interesting. Maybe some element of like an archive could be useful. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, so at this point, it's the user inputting the data from the beginning. So you're inputting all of the data, basically, from kind of these semi-specific categories. But there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, and then and then they actually they check um, for kind of, their computers check for the obvious kind of inconsistencies in the data. So for example, if you're if you've seen a species that's um, in, in the middle of winter when that species wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be out in the middle of winter, they can flag that and in the end the data is checked by an expert. So it's actually not a very efficient process because experts have to check all of this data. Um, the user experience is not as fluid, um, there's a lot of data needed, it's very time consuming. There's not really any kind of gamification or sticky kind of principles, there's not much to keep you coming back. Um, but yeah, you can, you have your, your data archived, which is kind of useful. Um, so yeah, I, I guess what I'm kind of saying with this is kind of what makes a, sci uh, a citizen science project successful, um, and to whom is it successful? Um, you know, is it to the citizen or to the scientist, or hopefully both, and, and, and why, how, you, how can you do that? Um, yeah, so that's what I've been interested in. I'm going to pass you on to Will now to talk about another example. Slightly different way. Yeah, I can't understand this site and control. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how citizen science is used here in astronomy. And um, there's a big project called the Galaxy Zoo, which is really the exemplar of this. Um, so there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, uh, and despite all the the diversity in galaxies, uh, we can actually split them into uh, pretty much just two over uh, overall archetypes. Uh, so these we call spirals and uh, elliptical galaxies. So if I were to show you a picture uh, of a galaxy and ask you which of these two types do you think this is? Spiral. Exactly. And, and this, is kind of, this is a really interesting thing. Even if, you're, it, even if you don't know nothing about galaxies and you've never seen a galaxy before, you have this association of the spiral pattern from things that you have seen in the real world. Uh, and so, so when we get a computer to do this, this is something called uh, transfer learning. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that again a little bit later. Uh, but the main point is that this is incredibly easy for a human to do. But it's actually very difficult to algorithmically construct something to, to determine uh, what a galaxy looks like um, based on, on just this pixel information. So the, the kind of standard uh, classification we have for galaxies follows this, uh, this old uh, Hubble tuning fork. Uh, so, so this is way back in the, uh, the 1930s, so close to 100 years ago now. And we still use this today to, to understand uh, what galaxies are like and where they came from, because the morphology actually encodes an awful lot of information about their formation history. Uh, and one of the things we really want to understand is why there are these two types of galaxies in the universe, uh, how they were assembled, how they formed. And of course, this includes our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and hence you know, where, we, where we come from, in a sense. So galaxy, galaxy morphology is Tricky to, uh, to, to, to write computer code to tell us, um, but it's fundamentally important. Uh, so, so this is why uh, visual morphologies have been used for, for very many years. Uh, but 
of late, things have been changing. They're going a little bit beyond what one scientist can manage in terms of the visual classification. So, so here I have uh, three different data sets. Uh, the lower two are, are uh, projects that I work on, uh, and the top one, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this is what uh, the Galaxy Zoo was based on. So it started collecting data in the year 2000, uh, and there's about a million galaxies that ideally we would like to have uh, morphological classifications for. Uh, now, if you have one person sitting at a desk, uh, classifying a galaxy every two seconds, full time, eight hours a day, it would take them 69 days to classify these million galaxies. Uh, and so, so now you can begin to understand why uh, a group of astronomers came along and said, well, you know, there's an awful lot of people in the world and there's only a few of us trying to do these classifications. Maybe there's another way. Uh, and this is how the Galaxy Zoo began. Uh, now, I should say I'm not, I wasn't one of the architects of Galaxy Zoo. I'm a, kind of a, a late time end user, so to speak. Uh, but you know, it, it fits in with the plan of what we were talking about, so I'm going to describe a little bit more about that. Uh, moving on, one of the big projects that I'm involved in now is the Dark Energy Survey. The, the, the actual aim of this project is to understand the expansion rate of the universe, um, but it's the, the currently the largest galaxy survey in existence, and so, so it's also it, it, an incredibly rich data set for understanding galaxy evolution. And in this case, we've got around 100 million galaxies that we would like to classify. So this would take one person 19 years, uh, and in fact, this is even beyond citizen science capabilities. Uh, so this is where the AI, the machine learning, really comes in. Uh, and, and you'll see how this works uh, in just a moment. Okay, so the original Galaxy Zoo. Uh, this was actually the project that kick-started the whole Zooniverse project. If you go to the Zooniverse website, you'll see there are hundreds of projects, including roughly two dozen uh, astronomy. Uh, but this, this really was uh, started by this, this Galaxy Zoo. Uh, so in the early days, you were asked to classify galaxies into one of six types. Uh, a new user would come along and they would have a training set of around six galaxies, which would essentially tell you the answer, so you could see uh, what you should be classifying and how. And then once you were trained on these six objects, you were free to, to go and classify. Uh, and the final results were essentially uh, 20 people's decisions or more uh, on, on what the galaxy was. Uh, and uh, you can see in these little image stamps examples of the different classes. Uh, so you have these the elliptical galaxies, which are pretty straightforward. And then the spiral galaxies are actually separated into three classes. So spiral galaxy is kind of like a plate morphology almost. So, so if, you edge it, if you view it edge on, it's very, very narrow. Uh, face on, it has this spiral structure, and the spiral structure can go in two ways. Now there's, there's kind of a couple of interesting things here that, that hark back to, to what Amy was saying a moment ago. Uh, firstly, about the gamification. So, so again, it uses the same sort of penguin watch idea that once you've finished classifying one galaxy, you're immediately onto the next one. Um, but even then, the, the actual, the, the kind of, uh, the most users actually only classified three galaxies before getting bored and wandering off. But there's a big long tail to that, and there are actually some users that classified hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And this, this is astonishing. Um, and, and this was actually due to the fact that there was a little leaderboard. So, so in the early days, there was, there was this competitive element. Um, it wasn't, I don't think it was intended to be a competition, but there were about three users that were competing against each other to become top of this leaderboard. And that's why we got so many classifications done. Uh, and eventually it became, well, these people must be spending half their lives classifying galaxies. Maybe this is something we should get rid of. Uh, so, so the leaderboard was taken down uh, and, well, presumably classifications slowed down after that. Um, the data set is actually used in more than 130 academic publications. So it's been incredibly successful. Uh, and this is why the Zooniverse, I think, has really taken off. Uh, and overall, there are around 600,000 galaxies classified in STSMs. Now, this is quite a simple uh, and, and straightforward thing to do. Uh, and, and so this is, a, this is actually something that we can attempt to do with, uh, with machine learning methods uh, and try and replicate the probabilities, the, the kind of classifications that humans come up with. Uh, and so how do we go about this? Well, we use artificial neural networks. Uh, so for those of you who understand those, that's great, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and give a very low-level explanation of what one of those is in a moment. So what we have really are a set of images. Um, if you think of a, a digital photo, uh, a JPEG, this is made up of three channels. So you've got a red, a green, and a blue channel. Uh, and this is very much the same, except we have black and white images uh, in, in a, kind of a, a given band. So, so U is very blue, G is, that stands for green, uh, R stands for red, I for red, and then Z, well, 
very end of what we can detect with a CCD. Uh, so we have these five different colors, essentially. Uh, from these, we work out the overall brightness. So we just, we just count uh, from, from the image uh, how, what, the, what the value uh, of, the, of the picture is. We use the ratios of these brightnesses. We look at the apparent size of the galaxy on the sky um, and, and how concentrated the light is in the center of the galaxy. Uh, and things like this. So, so there are many more uh, of these, these sort of features that we can come up with, but, but essentially they're just numbers in the end, worked out from these images. Uh, and these get passed through a magic black box, uh, and out the other side we get classification probabilities. Okay, great. Um, but obviously the, the mystery part is, is in this magic black box, uh, and, and really as scientists we don't like just passing things through a black box and getting an answer because we don't know what's going on. Uh, so, so I'm going to try and explain what goes on in this magic box. Uh, and for any experts out there, if I say something wrong, feel free to correct me. Um, as I said, the, uh, the features are, are really just numbers based on fluxes, sizes, etc. So these are pure numbers that go in, uh, and we want out at the other side the classification probabilities, which are also basically numbers. Uh, in between, each of these circles is actually just a very simple equation. Uh, we have the numbers that come from the, uh, the, the column before, and these are combined with a set of adjustable numbers, so numbers that we don't decide the value of beforehand. Uh, and, and it's really just a, yeah, it's just a very simple equation that takes you from one point to the next. Uh, and so it flows through, you start with your set of features on the left, the numbers just flow through these equations, and then you get the answer out on the right. And the way this works to actually train the network and to get good results is that at the end, you have a set of galaxies for which you know the answers. So the galaxy zoo, humans have classified, and so we know what the correct answer should be. So we compare the answers that we get from the network with the answers that we get from the humans, and then we change the adjustable numbers. And then we try again. And we try again until we get a good answer, essentially. Now there's some cleverness in how we choose the adjustable numbers, but that's the basics of it. Uh, and, and so really that's the mystery uh, of all this machine learning, all this artificial neural network stuff that goes on. Now, that's okay if all we want is spirals or ellipticals, but, but actually there's an awful lot of information in there that we can't access just by counting flux and measuring the size. We really want to know the detail of all these images, and for that we have to move on to something a little bit more complicated. So, so this is Galaxy Zoo 2, where uh, actually the humans were not trained at all. Um, what you get at here when you go on the website is each of these questions in turn. So we start at the top in the middle there, you're showing an image of a galaxy, and then you just click on the one that you think looks most like the image that you're seeing. And then if you follow the arrow, you'll see what the next question you're asked is. Uh, so, so if it looks kind of like a disk, then you're asked whether this is an edge on sort of thing or whether it's face on, uh, and then that will flow you down to the next question. And so the process really is just clicking on, on, on each of the things that you think best matches uh, the galaxy that you have in front of you. Okay, so this is great. This is kind of easy for humans to do. Uh, and and it's, it's led to things like understanding uh, galaxy mergers um, and the nature of the, the kind of central part of galaxies and, and things like this. But how do we replicate this with a neural network where if, if all we're using is, uh, is just counting flux and size? Well, we can't. So we have to pass through the, the actual image of the galaxy and start to use some of these more modern techniques like convolutional neural networks. I don't know if you've heard of these, but the idea here is that it works directly on the images. Uh, so we don't extract the features, we don't count fluxes or anything like that, we just give it image stamps. And, and then the, the, the algorithm works out the features that it will use in this magic box itself. Uh, so I won't go into the details of that, you can kind of ask me during the workshop session if you if you're not signed up to anything else, um, but we don't really have time to cover that. So, um, but the idea is, using a series of filters, you can you can um, sort of extract features that are useful in, in understanding what is going on with this galaxy. So, uh, so at this stage, we have well uh, a little competition. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that. Would be really nice. so, so there are two sheets. Um, you don't have to take part, obviously. Uh, if you do, just take one, pass it back, and, and dump all the uh, uh, all the unused ones. Yeah, so they're they seem kind of the, the two blocks are facing each other. So yeah. 
Uh, so the idea here is you will uh, classify 10 galaxies, uh, and then I will add up all of your results. So if you could pass these back either you know, somewhere to the rear of the room or to me by the end of the comfort break, uh, and then just before lunch, I will have put together your answers and, and, and we can compare you against how you perform against the, the convolutional neural network. Uh, how long do I have? I don't know. Ten minutes, okay. Oh, that's loads of time, actually. Fifteen. All right, okay. Um, so, towards the end of this uh, this Galaxy Zoo session, I, uh, I just wanted to, to show you a couple of ways in which the data are actually being used um, in terms of uh, try, trying to apply these techniques to, uh, to, to, to real things that are going to be useful for science. Um, so one of the things we're interested in is how Galaxy what happens when galaxies merge, so when they collide, hit each other, what, what result does that have uh, on, on the properties of the galaxy? The problem is these events are actually quite rare. So out of the, uh, the 600,000 galaxy zoo images, there's only around 3,000 uh, of these, these, these detailed galaxy mergers that we can find. Uh, and really to train a convolutional neural network, you need hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of images because it's, it's quite difficult for the computer to extract this information. Um, and so, so one of these, this, uh, this was a collaboration between some astronomers and uh, computer scientists that came up with a way to, 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 kind of, to, to shortcut this. Uh, and the idea is that they use an, an online database of just everyday images. So here we've got a chihuahua, a car, a cat, telephone box, etc. Uh, and they train a network to learn what features people pick out what features are interesting. Uh, and then with this trained network, they do a very quick retraining on the thing that they're interested in, these galaxy mergers, uh, and the performance in, in improves. Uh, so th this is what I was talking about earlier, about this transfer learning. What they're trying to do now is teach a computer to identify structures in images that are useful generally to, uh, to pick out the information from an image. Uh, so so this, was really, this was really cool. Uh, paper, uh, and then uh, uh, another one I want to mention is some work that happened in the Dark Energy Survey recently. So, as I mentioned, uh, Galaxy Zoo is based on images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, the Dark Energy Survey actually takes photos of, uh, of a rather different part of the sky, and there's only a very small amount of overlap in between. Now, humans have gone and classified all the galaxies in, in the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so there's only a small number of these galaxies that overlap between the two surveys. And so we don't have much data to train a machine to give us morphologies across the entire dark energy survey, which is what we would really love. We'd love to have morphologies for these 100 million galaxies. Uh, what this work did was to, to see whether we could use the, the galaxy zoom morphologies from, from Sloan and apply them to the dark energy survey. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is what they call domain adaptation, but really it's, a, it's very similar to this transfer learning in which you, you train up a machine on one data set uh, and then we have these, these two sets of images, so the top eight are from uh, Sloan and the bottom eight are from the Dark Energy Survey, our target survey, and you can see they're different in colour, they're slightly different in the detail because the Dark Energy Survey is a much more detailed uh, experiment, it, it takes deeper, more sensitive images. Um, and by using a kind of a training set to take you from one to the other, uh, they show that actually you can get performance on the dark energy survey images as well as you can get on, on the Sloan directly. And so basically this means that we don't have to run Galaxy Zoo all over again for the new data set. We can use the old results and transfer it across. And, and so that's a, that's a wonderful step as well. Okay, uh, so just to close this part, um, the future, I. What I've talked about so far is, is some work on methods to use machine learning uh, and really it's at the stage of uh, testing what we can achieve, uh, precision and things like this. The future is to actually apply these to the data, to, to the full surveys, the 100 million galaxies, and start using them for, for, for scientific exploration. Um, and then also to, to, to explore a little bit more about what the limits of this technique are. How much information can we really extract from, from these objects? Okay, um, so... So that's the end of the, the sort of examples of citizen science. 
Uh, and just to just to close this, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, how how the boundaries between scientists, designers, uh, and the public are, are beginning to get a little bit blurred. Uh, and, uh, and a great example for for discussing this is a website called Kaggle. Um, so I have no affiliation to Kaggle at all. It's a, it's a, it's another one. It's it's kind of similar to Zooniverse, but but in in this new respect, uh, where instead of collecting or analyzing the data um, or, or classifying the data, it's, it's being used to, to develop the software tools that will be used to actually uh, uh, do all this learning to, and, and even in some cases to, to analyze the data. So, so it's similar to citizen science, but it's the next step. Uh, it's, it's, taking, it's taking the next role of, of actually building uh, the, the tools and the applications that we want to use. Uh, so, so here are just some some screenshots from the website to show what's going on. Um, so this is the just the, the page of the the current competitions that are going on. So the idea here is that they they set a competition, they give you some data, uh, and you compete against other people around the world to get the best metric, to get the best results at the end. And in some of these competitions, you can actually get money for doing this. So so you can win money for helping us do science. LSST, this is another project that I'm involved in that's forthcoming, uh, and, and so this is really part preparing for, uh, for that project. Uh, so, so the idea is you will have data, you'll, you'll write your own algorithm, your, your own neural network uh, to, to, to process that data, and then the best one gets some money, second place also gets some money. Uh, it's not always about money, sometimes there's just knowledge or, or glory uh, for, for coming time. Um, and here I've just taken uh, uh, an a single example at uh, random to sort of dive into to what's going on. So if you pick one of these projects, then this is the sort of landing page that you see. It gives you uh, kind of a description of why you're doing it, why this is important, uh, and, and sets up the challenge. And then you'll see there's this, uh, this sort of list of tabs across the top where you have the overview, the data, and there's something called kernels uh, and the discussion. So if we go into this kernel, so you'll see it, it looks a little bit like a topic board. And actually what this is, this is people uh, putting up onto the, the, the web, like training examples or, or even their finished work uh, that they use to, uh, to try and um, achieve this, to try and win this challenge. And so if we go in to, to the top one of these, uh, you can see they've actually produced the code uh, and they're giving this out freely. To, to anyone who wants to, to copy or use this code um, based on what they did for this challenge. Uh, so, so in this sense, um, the public are no longer just involved in collecting the data, categorizing the data, uh, writing the algorithms, they're actually involved in teaching scientists, designers, etc., how to write these tools and how to use them. Uh, so this is really a, a kind of a new development uh, in the last few years. So, so here's kind of a summary of the, the changing role uh, of the public in, in science uh, and, and, and obviously other fields. So traditionally, of course, the public has funded projects through, uh, through taxes and through utilizing the output of the science that, that's done. Uh, but now they're much more involved in the collection, the processing, uh, and even the high level data process uh, and, and the development and, and instruction of analysis tools. Um, and I mean, I think that's all from me. I don't know if and you want to add anything? You're done? Okay. Uh, then we're done. Thank you. <laughs>